Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have the privilege of introducing our, our guest speaker this morning. And before I do, just maybe just a little bit of context. One of the challenges facing the U.S. military today is that our competitive advantage has eroded uh, over the past couple of decades. And what does that really mean? At one time, the U.S. military could project power when and where necessary to advance our national interests relatively uncontested. And beginning probably as early as 1991, our adversaries started to study uh, us, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, others, but primarily Russia and China, for what they perceive to be our vulnerabilities. And certainly over the last decade, decade and a half, they have developed a wide range of capabilities designed to exploit our, our vulnerabilities. And, you know, Pentagon always has buzzwords, and the one that has been associated with this is A2AD, which is anti-access area denial. And in plain English, what that really means is our ability to get someplace and then operate freely once we're there in sea, air, land, space, and cyberspace. And this morning, uh, General Smith, the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, is going to talk about one service's efforts to overcome this challenge and make a broader contribution to the joint force in restoring our competitive advantage. And he'll talk about that in a specific context. On a personal note, I think everybody has seen uh, General Smith's biography and his distinguished career, which began back in 1987. And Marines have an expression, every climb and place. And it's fair to say General Smith has served in every climb and place, both in peacetime and combat. I could, I could speak to that uh, at length from personal observation, having had the privilege of serving with him many, many times. But I'm actually representing Secretary Carter this morning, who is going to do the introduction uh, for General Smith. And so what I thought I'd do uh, is really highlight uh, what Secretary Carter thought of General Smith. I was uh, the chairman in 2000, and uh, I guess it was 16 uh, when we made that, that call. Uh, I think it was two, maybe late 2015. In 2015, and Secretary Carter had to make one of the very difficult decisions that leaders have to make. He had to he had to uh, remove somebody from his personal staff, his senior military assistant. So it's a three star uh, in the U.S. military. That job is typically uh, a job that almost everyone that's ever been in that job has gone automatically to four stars and been a combatant commander or a service chief out of that job. Think about it. You have the Secretary of Defense who has two million men and women. Uh, responsible, and he's going to select somebody on his personal staff. You can you can suffice to say that he's going to pick somebody who's who's exceptional. In any event, Secretary Carter had to remove that individual from his staff, and uh, given the tempo of events, you know he was obviously pretty concerned about what am I going to do uh, to replace uh, this lieutenant general. And uh, and I said I was the chairman. I said, well, well Miss Secretary, just tell me who you trust amongst the senior leaders in the in the department. Who do you trust? Who do you feel comfortable with? I, I understand you don't have time to have friction and we don't have time to have a big transition. So you tell me who you trust and we'll go make it happen. We'll get that person for you. He said, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, impact somebody's career and those kind of things. I said, Mr. Secretary, who do you trust? I trust Eric Smith. Eric Smith had worked for him when he was a deputy secretary of defense. General Smith, uh, I had just dispatched to Miami, Florida as the Marine component for the United States Southern Command, and he was there about four months. And I, I said, well, Ms. Ms. Secretary, if you want Eric Smith, we'll get you Eric Smith. And uh, he was a little bit worried about uh, about his career path. We weren't worried about inconveniencing him with a move. We, the, the consequences were much were much greater than that. And I assured I assured the secretary that uh, Eric Smith, uh, Brigadier General Eric Smith at the time, would be absolutely fine no matter what assignment we sent him to. Right now, he'll be fine. He'll still be around, having an impact, being a senior leader in the future. And then we we called General Smith, who had been there four months. He was out on his boat fishing. The signal was a little bit broken. And I said, uh, hey, Eric, uh, is Trish there? That's his spouse. Uh, he said, she is. I said, well, do not, do not tell her who's on the phone right now. I, I don't want to be I don't want to be associated with this phone call. <laughs> but but you need to be in Washington, D.C. 
in about 48 hours. And uh, so General Smith pulled his boat in. He could tell you more stories. We got other things to talk about here this morning. Pulled his boat in. I think that was maybe a Wednesday or a Thursday. And and on Saturday morning, he was reporting to duty for Secretary Carter. But what I really wanted to tell you uh, is what Secretary Carter would have would have said in terms of Eric Smith's positive, persuasive leadership, his strategic vision, his commitment, his work ethic, and all of those things. Because as I said, there's somebody who's the Secretary of Defense who needs to fill the role of the senior military assistant uh, in the Department of Defense, and he can pick from any of the general officers and admirals and so forth that were there at the time. And because of uh, how many things he had going on and the challenges that he was confronted with, he wanted someone that he completely trust. And, uh, and he picked General Eric Smith. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to introduce somebody I consider a personal friend, somebody who's grappling with these difficult issues that I know we'll all talk about today, but someone uh, who anyone who's ever been around him would say the same thing that Secretary Carter would say today, someone that you can trust. So with that, General Smith. Okay. It's on for their recording, so it's on. There we go. Um, all right, so before we, and I will not run the clock out on you, I promise. I will take questions all day. Um, if Dr. Carter was here, uh, who, who, like General Dunford, I considered a personal friend and a mentor, um, he would also tell you one of our first car conversations, he was trying to explain blast propagation. I have a political science degree from Texas A&M. Um, he was trying to explain blast propagation theory about how it moves around a hull of a, of a, of a vehicle. And he's explaining it, you know, doing theoretical physics and looking at him with my stunned mullet look as a political science major and said, I don't get, he goes, okay. So, and he keeps explaining it. And at some point in this 30 minute car ride, I said, Hey, you speaking louder and slower is not going to make me understand. He's like, all right. And he just kept doing it. And uh, and he he did that often. Uh, so anyway, uh, it is a, a a it is a privilege uh, to be here with you. Um, I, I I truly it's a privilege to get to see uh, Chairman Dunford. Uh, it is a sad day not getting to see Dr. Carter, um, who was who was truly a brilliant mind and a and a committed uh, public servant. I mean, committed all in, jump in the deep end, give everything. And we don't have enough of those uh, today. So uh, it is uh, it is very uh, kind of bittersweet because the last time I was here in this building was when Dr. Secretary Carter was being inter was being interviewed by Graham Allison. Uh, so it was a happy memory. And now, you know, it's it's a different memory in this building. But what I thought I would talk to you about today uh, and not talk to you about, but why I came to answer your questions about anything. You can take this anywhere you want to go anywhere. Um, Change management, uh, difficult organizational change, incredibly difficult. Um, I don't think I have it exactly right on behalf of my boss or commandant, but I, th I think I understand how to do organizational change management in an organization, which is by nature difficult to change, resistant to change, you know, tradition bound, et cetera. Um, and I hear this a lot. My, my daughter uh, happens to work for uh, McKinsey down in Houston, and she does that as well. She's often stunned that they pay McKinsey prices, and then they don't take her advice, um, uh, although she is still on my phone plan. Um, so I don't really know why. I would. <laughs> she actually is off. She's off. I Venmo her, and she Venmos me back the money. with a. I get the sad emoji. Uh, she Venmos me back. But I, I don't under, uh, understand either why you would ask to make change and then not actually do it. So we were asked to make change with the national defense strategies to go after the challenges that Chairman Dunford has explained, which is uh, an eroding um, capability advantage. And so we did make those changes, which are uh, unpopular in some areas because, again, change is very difficult and change is hard. So if you want to know about that, I can talk to you about how to do it. I can tell you the mistakes that we have made and the successes we've had. And that's it. I'll, I'll leave it there. And I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions on any subject. I will warn you up, up front. I'm pretty candid. Um, so I, I, non-attribution, uh, not a fan, right? Because non-attribution and non-retribution, two totally different things. And I get a lot of non-attribution that somehow leads back to retribution. So I just, I assume everything's on the record. 
I don't do Chatham House, whatever you want. I, I am open to anything. If I say it, it's my word on it. So you can associate me with it. And so I'm happy to take your questions and I'll be uh, as candid as, as I can be. And that, that's it. General, that's a, that's a great segue. And uh, just as we kick this off, a couple of admin notes. My name is Richard Nykirk. I'm a lieutenant colonel currently serving in the United States Marine Corps and one of the Kennedy School National Security Fellows. Uh, so along with my uh, colleague, Mr. Ryan Kennedy back there from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, we're obviously pleased to welcome you to today's discussion. It's entitled Organizational Change, How the Marine Corps is Modernizing for the Future. This event is part of the Belfer Center's Defense Project, which seeks to advance policy-relevant knowledge in defense and international security. Today's event is a hybrid forum, so we have in-person audience members, and then there are also about 150 folks joining us via an online webinar. As the general mentioned, remarks will be on the record for attribution. This is a discussion that will be recorded, and we'll also post it to the Belfer Center's website uh, that you can view it later if you'd like. When we open for questions, uh, please re just request a microphone if you're in the audience by raising your hand, and uh, we'll have someone bring you a microphone. For those on the webinar, please type your questions into the um, field, and my colleague Ryan Kennedy will field those questions and present them to General Smith on your behalf. With that, sir, welcome to the Kennedy School. Thanks for being here. And uh, let's jump right in on how the Marine Corps is executing some hard organizational change. Um, I'll ask kind of the first question or so just to prime the pump. Uh, and before I do so, just a little background to set the stage on the Marine Corps and, and the Marine Corps culture. Just We all come from a variety of backgrounds here. Um, but the changes the Marine Corps is going through right now, I think, are an excellent um, way to study change in any corporation or academic environment. Just because of the emotional investment that we have in the Marine Corps, it kind of magnifies these changes that you see at a, at a more micro level, perhaps, uh, in other institutions. And so this level of emotional investment you know, from Marines really comes from... Um, it comes from the ties that we have with both the units in the Marine Corps, so the sub-organizations, and also the, the actual equipment that we have. Because in many, in many cases, we spend more time with those organizations, those men and women in uniform, and that equipment than we do with our very families. Um, we deploy with them, we go to combat, we've seen them save our lives, we depend upon them for kind of that life. And so the decisions that we make as we tweak both equipment and organizational structure have a very real impact to Marines, right? It's the cost of our lives. You know, we either have a little longer to live or it gets shortened quite rapidly. Um, and so as we take a look at some of these units and legacies that, uh, that are changing as, as we go into this, this kind of future modernization, you know, people really identify with those units, right? You don't just in them, but they are a part of you. You are part of them. You get them tattooed on your bodies. I, I doubt many of us are going to get HKS tattoos as we uh, as we leave from here. Um, Why well, wouldn't? That's right. <laughs> yeah, just, I don't have one, but maybe <laughs> you guys invite me to hang around through Friday night. Maybe absolutely. Uh, on the other level, the Marine Corps is also a very fiercely proud service. We're proud of our heritage. You know, we have some monikers of being first to fight, and uh, every Marine a rifleman. And so we look back at the tactical successes we've had with current organizations, equipment, and formations. Um, and I think there's this question of, well, hey, if it's not broken, why are we changing it? And so just to set some of that as context about why some of these changes the Commandant and the Marine Corps are doing have such an emotional and a visceral reaction uh, and can be instructive to us to study across the wide landscape of, of occupations. So, sir, just... By way of kind of the first question, it's really going to be a timing question about, about why now, but General Berger is the current commandant of the Marine Corps. He took over in 2019 and immediately kind of set about redesigning the force, force design, uh, modernizing the force. And what this has entailed to some degree has been, you know, getting rid of all tanks in the Marine Corps, getting rid of heavy bridging assets, getting rid of many of our uh, military police or law enforcement battalions, cutting infantry battalions and aviation squadrons, and then at the same time, investing in modernization of things like you know, long-range precision munitions, uh, loitering munitions, uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, anti-ship cruise missiles, unmanned vessels and vehicles, and, and things of that nature. And so uh, General Berger came to the same conclusion that uh, General Neller, his predecessor, had that 
the Marine Corps was not organized, trained, equipped, uh, or postured to meet the demands of the future operating environment. And so I guess, sir, the, the first question would be same information uh, as, 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 you know, that, that the Marine Corps has known about maybe for a little while, but why the urgency, why the need to go all in now and to do it in, in what some would probably characterize as like such a drastic manner as opposed to kind of salami slice, hey, let's do a little bit over time and, and see how this goes. Um, what I would offer is if, if you are going to, if you're going to, undertake change within an organization. First, you have to know the why. It has to be solidified. What's the, what's the reason, purpose for you doing it? We have a national defense strategy, which if you believe in civil control of the military, big fan. Um, the national defense strategy comes out of the national military strategy, which comes out of uh, the national security strategy. So when the president says, this is where we are going, then as, a, as an element of the, of the, the federal government, we respond to that. So it comes down to the national defense strategy in the last two. And again, not a political statement. You, you probably couldn't have two more different administrations. And both of those 2018 and, and 2022 national defense strategies said, this is someone, this is what you need to do. You need to pace off of the fastest runner, China. Okay. You, you have to be able to deal with that should that become um, an active threat. So the imperative was we had spent quite a bit of time in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we came out of those wars and said, we, we have been focused here and now need to focus here. And we're not best. we left out the word, I think, best organized, trained, and equipped. Marines are still going to do what they had to do. But we, we could better organize, train, and equip. I'm the father of a Marine, so this is a little bit personal for me. Um, so the imperative was we, we are not getting faster right now. And if you salami slice it and kind of inch, the, the inevitable pull from uh, within your own organization, from within the Department of Defense, from industry, whatever the, 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 the drag shoot will be, you'll never get there. It's, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, I, I'm a fisherman, not a hunter, but they, they will say, you know, you shoot, shoot behind the duck. Your target's moving. You, you have to lead that target. Um, don't come out aggressively. You will not get where you want to go. And in all candor, I think General Berger uh, knew that. He had been in the Pacific for years, uh, in Marine Corps Force Pacific and First Marine Expeditionary Force, and knew that we had to shoot right of that target, to land on the target. So we came out very, very aggressively with what do I need to counter that threat, to be a deterrent force? And that the issue for General Berger was there's a currently a nuclear deterrent. There should be something else to deter. There should be some other capability that will cause any adversary, Russia, Iran, North Korea, China, to, to say maybe today's not the day. And again, as the father of two, I, I like that. I'm a big fan of adversaries saying maybe today's not the day. And that is how you buy time. You buy time for diplomatic solutions. You buy time for... Uh, things to change. So that, that was the in, impetus for us to move quickly. Because if you say, how, much, how many more days do you wish to be in a position of disadvantage? The answer is zero, none. I want to be in a position of advantage today. So there was an impetus to move and move very quickly. And we did. And, uh, and I think, you know, history will be the judge, but I'm watching it unfold now and we're in a pretty good place. Uh, thank you, sir. The the second question, and then we'll open it up. And again, just raise your hand and we'll bring a mic to you. Um, this one really goes, I think, to uh, to criticism and, and dialogue and, and dealing with dissent in, uh, during organizational change. Um, it, it seems to me that the way the Marine Corps changes fits very well with, with the history of the Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps, during the interwar years, very, studied up on amphibious doctrine, brought some equipment to bear. That was useful then, you know, later in World War II. We, we saw the same thing in Korea with some of the first use of helicopters and vertical envelopment and some of those tactics and techniques and, and ways that we employ them. Uh, the Marine Corps right now is out in front of the joint force on some of these modernization uh, initiatives uh, as well. But despite that kind of history that the Marine Corps prides ourselves on of innovation and experimentation and being willing to, to lean forward and and, and test things, 
uh, there has been uh, some disagreement both inside the Marine Corps and and from you know folks that have been retired you know outside of the Marine Corps now. Um, one thing that perhaps the audience isn't aware of is, is the culture in the Marine Corps really welcomes this debate. And the Marine Corps has two internal um, publications, the Marine Corps Gazette and Leatherneck, that encourage really from the most junior levels uh, people to contribute and write thought pieces and um, ideas. And, and it really percolates. And I've been very uh, impressed that general officers and senior enlisted are more than willing to enter into those debates and dialogues within the force. And so there's this kind of very professional uh, back and forth that, that the Marine Corps facilitates and encourages, uh, in addition to our education institutions and, and other you know, professional military education and whatnot. However, it seems that with force design, um, there's really been this push to, to kind of make things public and put things in the newspapers from the centers and instead of dealing with it um, and, and I think yourself and the Commandant have welcomed this criticism and have been very open about that. But could you talk a little bit, sir, just about, you know, how does the Marine Corps view that kind of disagreement? How do they deal with it, both from folks inside the Marine Corps and those outside? Sure. And then maybe even on the Hill, you know, that's that's ultimately where where our budget comes from. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the Hill. Um, we, we, I, I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill um, because congressional oversight matters. Um, and so explaining what are, what are you doing with the budget? What are, we, we gave you this. We gave you $20 to go to the store and buy milk, egg, and cheese. I want to see a receipt and change. I don't want to see chips and soda. And, you know, you, you, and there's no money left in my 20. That, that's what should happen. That is, that is appropriate lawful oversight. So I spent a lot of time with the four big committees, the Senate Armed Services Committee, House Armed Services Committee, Senate uh, Appropriations Committee for Defense, House Appropriations Committee for Defense, the big four, um, both with professional staff members, with with rankings and with chairman, um, explaining this is what we're doing. And this is how we are spending, um, you know, my mom's uh, tax dollars. So we have good support on the Hill because the, the Hill understands what the, the threat is. I mean, the Hill is a place. It's not a person, right? It's like when people say the White House, well, who in the White House? Hey, they're like, well, the White House wanted this. You know, it's like the Pentagon said, well, which person? There's a bunch of them. So, so the members uh, of the various committees and subcommittees are asking hard questions about why this uh, tactic, why this equipment, why this strategy. I think we're, we're in a good place there. If you look at uh, this last year's testimony, it was, we support what you're doing. And in fact, we want you to accelerate it because we, we want to deter, we want to prevent, we want to provide the same uh, stability we've been providing in the Indo-Pacific for 75 years. Uh, internal to the Marine Corps, we're, we're happy to have the debate. If you go to uh, our Marine Corps University in Quantico, pretty vibrant debate. It's no different than, well, the GPA may not quite be the same, but um, but there, there is there is a Marine Corps University, and there's actually some some quite uh, smart individuals down there who who do debate this because their lives depend on it. So it, the robustness of that debate probably would be surprising to many because they do it in the gym and in the morning or at night. They do it in the uh, in lunchroom, you know, the whole thing. And it, it's a it's a pretty constant debate. So we welcome that. Uh, frankly, um, and I won't dwell on it, but when you when you want to have a, a the debate is fine. When it becomes uh, personal, that that becomes a problem, and and that's true with any organizational change. You're getting rid of my section. You're getting rid of my uh, former platform. You know, I flew that airplane for a long time. When it gets personal, um, it, arguments lose their their wasta, if you will. They lose their credibility because again, I spent about four years with a guy who who did nothing but um, data facts. And I work for a, a deputy secretary of defense now who is all about data. Show me the data. And if you can bring data, then I will absolutely make a change. But uh, the, the, uh, the ad hominem uh, personal stuff is, is probably unhelpful. Uh, it's, it's lawful. It's legal. It's no problem. Uh, I, I just don't find it particularly helpful. But da data and science are king. Uh, there used to be a sign outside of uh, acquisitions, technology, and logistics, a guy named Frank Kendall. And the sign said, in God we trust. All others must bring data, right? Bring me your data. Show me. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're using a pretty, uh, we call it the virtuous cycle concept. Smart people sitting around thinking about how to, how to work intractable problems, how to untie the Gordian knot. 
concept that goes to uh, a war game, right? So you, you war game a concept because that's that's computer based. It doesn't cost much, right? You just compute. and then you experiment with it and you find out you had it wrong or you had some of it right, and then you do feedback. Concept, war game, experiment, feedback. It's, it's constant. I mean, it is. The only thing that is constant is change. So you have to change. What you cannot do is anchor yourself to a piece of equipment. Way, way too early, and I'll stop and take your questions. Way too early to, to learn, uh, to know the lessons of, of uh, Russia's uh, attacks on Ukraine, unprovoked and unlawful, I might add. Um, Way too early. But one thing that is is a truism, it does come down to the individual will of soldier, of the individual, uh, the person. That, that individual spirit, willingness to, to subordinate yourself to something greater, that is immutable. And so you can take that lesson away. So for the Marine Corps, we haven't changed Marines. And I have a son who's a Marine, as does our Commandant General Berger. Um, that part has not changed. If you were, and I hope you all do, if you come to Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, or if you come down to Quantico, Virginia, where we make officers, or if you go out to San Diego, um, you, you would walk away saying, wow, I, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know that. Uh, you, and you're truly welcome. I mean, it's your tax dollars. You were, those bases are open to you every Friday. You can see a whole bunch of new Marines and you can talk to them and ask them. We don't, you know, we don't succumb them over to a thing and say, you can't talk to the public. I mean, we, we then return them to the public. That's our goal is to return citizens better, we hope, than, than we receive them. So uh, I hope you do do that in all candor because uh, we're still making Marines, hoping to make better Marines uh, than we've made in the past. They're certainly better than I was when I came. Okay, I'm done on my soliloquy there. Sorry about that. But again, I'm, so you have to cut me a little slack here as a father because um, uh, I do get excited about this because I, I have a son who's a captain who if things go uh, to a bad place, you know, and it is just a quick note, been married for 35 years, uh, very different. When I go off, Iraq, Afghanistan, just like, okay, well, you be careful. Um, <clears throat> with our son, it's like, hey, because he was in Kuwait and Iraq. She's, she's like, oh, yeah. I say, hey, uh, yeah, you'll be fine. But this is our son. So very different. Uh, and I will tell you, very different sending your children places. Um, so I'm always mindful of that as is a commandant. Ready for questions? Yes, sir. Sir, Major Michael Duffy, U.S. Army. Hey, how you doing, Mike? Not too bad, sir. Mike or Michael? Mike. Michael it is. Yes, sir. Uh, the amphibious team, Marine Corps is only half of it. The Navy's the other big half. Given the way the Marine Corps is trying to shift uh, amphibious doctrine, what are they doing to get the Navy's buy-in, especially given how hard it is to project amphibious ships, sure. build the ships, especially given our current shipyard issues? What, what are we doing to get the Navy's buy-in? Yeah. So, so personal relationships matter. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, that has just been doing a lot of flying, dried out environments. Um, personal relationships matter, but they're not enough to get you across the goal line. Uh, Dr. Carter would say they're necessary, but not sufficient, right? I think I heard that about a gajillion times. Um, necessary, but not sufficient. So personal relationships matter. because But if you don't have them, you can't even get started. So first, it starts off with candid conversations. The vice, you know, uh, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, a good friend of mine, you have a candid conversation. Um, with fleet commanders, with the, the Navy staff about what, what is the value of the Navy Marine Corps team and that ability to be forward deployed 24-7 with organic mobility. That is playing itself out at the fleet level. We have multiple fleets. We have 5th Fleet in Bahrain. We have 6th Fleet that's in the Mediterranean, 7th um, Fleet in, in Japan. So we have multiple fleets and we have things called Marine Expeditionary Forces, you know, 40-ish uh, thousand. Um, they are completely tied together. Where it always comes down to is when there's, this is the last dollar authorized to be spent or appropriated to be spent, where are we going to spend it? That, that's where the rub comes in, in the Pentagon, frankly. Because it's, it's, you know, there's one ice cream cone, two kids. What are you going to do with that? Uh, and and there's, there's no way to split that. So you really have to, and what we're doing is we're wargaming together. We're experimenting together to show the value of the amphibious force. And frankly, the Marines also get from that, okay, but what's the purpose? The purpose isn't the amphibious force. The amphibious force is there in order to enable the national defense strategy, which is to deter, to counter aggression, to provide a uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. So both sides, Navy and Marine Corps, have to work together to understand that. And again, we, we do live under a nuclear uh, triad 
that is that deterrence. And the Columbia submarine is coming on board uh, to replace a very aging Ohio uh, class submarine. And that has to be paid for too. So we are in fact, wargaming, experimenting, and just having daily debates about the efficacy of this platform, that platform. And I would say the Navy and us are, are much closer than, than I think it's portrayed in the press, you know, in all candor. It's not that, that's wrong. Are people arguing? Yes. But do we have candid conversations about, about what is needed and are the combatant commanders, the fleet commanders saying, I need those amphibious ships. Cause remember they, what they do is if there's a humanitarian assistance or disaster relief, they respond to that in Bangladesh and Guam and, uh, and Katrina and uh, Haiti. But that is, you know, about, uh, 21,000 tons of, of American sovereignty that can sit 12 miles off the coast and do a lot of good because of the ability, it's an F-150 pickup truck that can bring a lot with it. Um, that, that is day-to-day evacuating an embassy because unfortunately, you know, there, there are unstable places around the world. I've done a couple of NEOs, my, non-combatant evacuation operations myself. You need that national sovereign piece of territory and people understand the value in that. So I think we're closer than, than is, is often portrayed. Thanks, Michael. Okay. It's right up here up front. <clears throat> Hey, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Weiss, our United States Air Force. Prior to that, I was also in the Navy uh, for about 14 years. Uh, so prior to my time here about four years ago, I was the force design branch chief with Air Force Futures. Uh, I, I will freely admit General Berger's document with regards to the 2030 roadmap. That was absolutely one of my templates when I was at Futures Command with the Air Force. My question is somewhat twofold. Uh, the first one is, how was the Marines able to expedite the change that you've done. So underneath General Brown, accelerate change or lose, sure. you know, the Air Force has a mandate to move out and get it done. However, we have not done, at least in my opinion, at the level and uh, rapidity that you have been able to do uh, within the Marine Corps. So one, how were you able to expedite change as required? And then simultaneously, that manpower you lost as you collapse down your maneuver brigades and you collapse down your, your, your heavy armor. What happened to that manpower, sir? Sure. Thank so the, the Marine Corps, one, it got a little bit smaller. Uh, we, we knew that uh, from about 182,000 to about 176,000, 175. Um, and so that, that manpower was, some of it was moved to other higher priorities, long range strike, uh, um, a lot of cyber pieces, because we live in a world now where if you turn on your cell phone, you were immediately targetable, you were findable. And we're certainly seeing that from the Ukraine. So some of it went into those areas, into logistics. Because logistics is king, right? With, without logistics, you you are not going to stay very long in any in any conflict. Some of it, we got smaller because we we believed we had to self fund. Uh, people will criticize that, uh, I think, in, until their dying day. But the commitment was, we're going to self fund. We're not going to do what often happens is we need more money. Well, why do you need more money? Well, I, I, I'm selling the family car, but but not right now. So I need the new car, but I'm going to keep the old car, which is that's how your garage fills up. Right. And no offense to those of you with parents that are probably sadly my age, but you know, uh, my parents, we were just cleaning up my mom's garage and it's like, well, holy cow, you know, I mean, that's stuff that should have been gone 30 years ago, literally 35 years ago. when I, when I joined the Marine Corps, we weren't going to do that. We said, we're going to self fund. We're going to internally reorganize. And we did. People said, ah, oh, you'll never keep the money. Well, that's again why we work with Congress to say, here's what I'm doing. I would like to take this money and move it to here. Do you authorize that? And they said, yes. And so then we moved out pretty quickly on certain platforms. We said, look, uh, for example, and this is a small example, tanks, 72 tons plus fuel. And it's huge, massive. If the purpose of a tank is, is in part to kill another tank, that, that happens at about four kilometers, best case, four kilometers. But I can do that with a missile system at 90 kilometers. Why would I bring 72 tons to do what I can do for 800 pounds? That, that doesn't make sense to me. So wholesale move. That will be controversial, but in my opinion, that's it's the opportunity cost of keeping 72 tons that drinks gas at about seven gallons per mile. Uh, I think to start it up, it's, I, I can't afford that. What else could I bring in place of that fuel? So we just said, we're doing that. And we moved and we had briefed the secretary of defense Esper. And then now secretary of defense Austin said, we're doing this. And we got, we got that buy-in where we, we failed, I think was, was 
with our with the and this is for institutional change management your, your other shareholders right so our retired community could have done much better the active community is a little bit easier because when the commandant says move you move um kind of works that way uh, the uniform code of military justice you know I, I can't not show up for work i can't tell my boss no uh, well i can if it's an un unlawful order but you know uh, generally speaking um they, they like us to show up for work and you know um where the appropriate thing to work, all that kind of stuff. But we we didn't uh, we didn't calculate that as well as we should and inform that particular constituency. Could have done a much better job. But institutional change management, again, taking back the theme is you better know the why, you better have some data to back it up, and then you better stay on your message. Because if your message, you, you change with data, but if you just change your message left and right, then you, you, you gain no buy-in, you gain no credibility. So first study the problem, build the data, and then move. And once you move, do not apologize for it. Right? We move because of this, and we're committed to it. And if you're not committed to it, nobody else will be committed to it either. So hopefully that answers at least some of your question. Thanks. We're going to take our next question from the webinar, and then after that, we'll come right over here. And give me, give me a high sign if I'm, if I'm uh, give me something that's a World Series time. So, you know, give me some signal. Hey, no, you're not hitting it for us. You need to be a little more candid or give me give me a signal and i will i will respond i'm pretty good at, at at doing what i'm asked to do sir this first question is about risk mitigation uh that are accompanying these force planning changes okay um there's generally two approaches for mitigating risk you can either focus narrowly on some driving variables or you could stay a little more versatile and uh on a wide focus on a wider range of contingencies the core has generally been in that latter camp and focused on a little more versatility. Has that changed now with this new force structure choices? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the question on risk management, right? Uh, risk mitigation. So first, I would disagree with the premise. There's two ways to deal with risk. One is you mitigate it. Two is you accept it. You can do both. You do not have to mitigate. If it's temporal, you can, in fact, accept it for a period of time. And that's what we've done. Because you, we're a cash and carry business. Uh, you can't violate the Anti-Deficiency Act. You know, I can't receive an aircraft and not pay for it. Um, that, that, doesn't, that is unlawful. So you got to generate the funds in order to procure something or build a training pipeline, which could take months to train an individual to be a nationally credentialed cyber operator, for example. So in that intervening period between taking something and, and getting rid of it so that you now have funds available if Congress allows you to keep them and move them. And then you invest in something that takes time to grow, to procure this system or this trainee, this Marine. Well, that intervening period could be two years. So while well, we're going to mitigate, okay, well, risk mitigation is an option, which really means you, you keep some of what you were holding. And now I have two training pipelines. I have two production pipelines, or you can accept that risk in certain areas for two years. You can mitigate it with other units, with other things, but you don't necessarily have to hold on to old to mitigate. So the Marine Corps is still a general purpose force, but we are now at a point where we're going against a peer adversary, a peer. That has not happened since 1945. 1945 is the last time that we as Marine Corps were under threat from uh, enemy aviation. 1945. Not Korea, not Vietnam not the Gulf Wars, 1945. That, that requires a significant change to how you think, and goes back to the earlier question from you, Rich, is why the impetus to move quickly? Because our peers, I don't say near peer anymore, our peers have capability that can, in fact, challenge us in certain domains. So you got to move quickly. And so being a generalist, uh, is still important. That's what our Marine Expeditionary Units still do. They will always be the coin of the realm for us. Uh, those are our, you see it, when there's 2,500 Marines off the coast of Somalia, off the coast of Liberia, that's a Marine Expeditionary Unit. Three ships, 2,500 Marines, they can evacuate, they can do humanitarian assistance, they can, they can strike if required. That will always be there. But you don't have to be, and you can't be a generalist uh, in, in a world where hypersonic missiles are in fact state of the art, uh, the norm, where quantum and edge computing is in fact the norm. You, you can't be a generalist there. 
So I, I would say temporal risk has to be accepted. Otherwise, you'll spend all the dollars and the resources to, to advance, to progress. You'll spend it on mitigating risk. And instead of going from here to here, you'll go from here to here. It'll be imperceptible and you won't close the gap or, or extend your existing, your extant gap against someone who would, who would alter the way you do business in the free and open Indo-Pacific. That's all we, that's what we're asking for. Free and open Indo-Pacific. I've been to Malaysia, um, been to Japan, been to Korea, been to Thailand, uh, Australia, Philippines, seek the same. A free and open Indo-Pacific. Don't tell me where I can and cannot go. Um, and that, frankly, is what China does right now. Um, establishing air defense identification zones, et cetera. We're not interested in being told where we can and can't go or telling others where they can and can't go. So hopefully that answers that one, Ryan. You're nodding for the person on the webinar. There's 150 people on the webinar. There's 150 people who stay there on the webinar. So we'll see, right? Uh, see how many, how many uh, camera screens are open. Um, and I, was, I did the COVID thing too. So I'm, I'm tracking that. Did a lot of meetings that I don't remember. Um, but I was there because I was clocked in. My IP address was on. Please, sir. Uh, thanks, General Smith, for, for coming. I'm Miles Newman. I'm an investor at Insight Partners. We're an investment firm in New York. I thanks. wanted to ask, so you're presiding over a major, a major strategic inflection. So from Great War or the Global War on Terror to Great Power Competition, what are the main blockers in, in instituting organizational change that you see from Congress to mid-levels to contractors and primes? And do you draw on any historical analogs or examples to inform the way in which you do this as this isn't the Marines' uh, first go around here? Sure. So the, the, the first question on blockers, um, so I, I would never say, um, you know, Congress is a, is a blocker. They, they are required to provide congressional oversight and, and they and their professional staff members, and I'm not saying this because this is going out there because I talk to them often. Um, they do a good job of challenging. Why? Before I spend, again, my mom, fixed income, Plano, Texas, um, before she sp spends her contribution to the national uh, kitty sh show me why 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 can't you do that cheaper better smarter a different way uh i get grilled on that all the time and i should um the the the, the blockers industry be very candid i talk to industry a lot of time uh, look they want to make a profit because they want to pay their employees do health care i want them to make less of a profit so we are in this in intractable love-hate relationship um where i i need something because again, when I send, uh, or, or when our commandant or a combatant commander, because the combatant commanders actually employ the force, the service produces the force. When they send it into harm's way, you better make dang sure you got a plan for that force to be successful. If not, again, hugely uh, personal for me, again, with, uh, who has a son who's a captain who, who will be part of that force. You better make sure that, uh, that we're getting what we paid for. Wicked hard also. I mean, because Silicon Valley, you know, when you go out to TechCrunch, it's great. You know, try it, fails, not a problem. We'll move on, you know. Yeah, but that's not tax money. So we are in this inenviable comply with Department of Defense regulations, procurement regulations, which people at TechCrunch would, would go nuts. Guys like Chris Lynch, who we hired specifically for that purpose to kind of help us blend or Defense Innovation Unit Expeditionary. Um, just looking at our regulations, you know, saying, you guys got to be kidding. You know, that is a constant uh, blocker friction point. Comply with the law, move fast. Um, so I, I would I would hit that. Historical examples, um, the, the one that I honestly look at is uh, we had a guy named Pete Ellis who prior to World War II was out in the 20s looking around and saying, hey, you're going to do amphibious warfare. And it may be Japan. And we said, Japan's our best ally now. General Yamazaki is their chief of defense, is a, is a personal friend. Uh, we, we get along great. A, a tremendous ally, tremendous. And by the way, we have a lot of friends. We do. Uh, other people have fewer friends. I'm just, just telling you. Now, publicly, people will often say, yeah, we're good. And then I just came back from a uh, quick trip to the Middle East, and it's, you know, there's the public and there's the private. And everybody knows that. That's how diplomacy works. But Pete Ellis, was uh, I don't like the word visionary, you know, but he was prescient about what may happen. And he, what he knew is I don't have to be 100% right, but I cannot be 100% wrong. And he was not wrong. 
So that's a great example. Now that cost him some of his personal reputation. Um, so be it, right? If you're here for your personal reputation, wrong business. So that's a, that is a, a great example. The other examples are that we usually get this wrong because we got a hundred percent track record of not predicting the next war or, or predicting it incorrectly. So that is actually where I draw my personal from. First Gulf War, I was a lieutenant. We show up in Okinawa. We got off the plane, and our operations officer met us and said, Iraq just invaded Kuwait. He said, oh, was that pizza? You know, and I was moving off to that. I mean, where? And, and then when we left, oh, well, not coming back. We, we, we get it wrong most of the time. You don't have to get it right, but you can't get it wrong. But Pete Ellis is somebody that I actually look at. See, got that right. At, at a cost. Yes, sir. Or, yes, sir. <clears throat> Morning, sir. Uh, Commander Craig Allen, U.S. Coast Guard. Hey. Honor to have you uh, with us today. Oh, um, Thanks, sir. So the uh, my my question kind of has to has to do with the uh, sort of the the time window um, that that you have to to execute this change. Um, in in the Coast Guard, we had a uh, kind of a modernization um, post Katrina, and it was a it was a huge push, major restructuring. Maybe not as dramatic as as the Marine Corps, but there was a lot of uh, a lot of people who didn't agree with the changes, um, which you can uh, I think sympathize with. And the commandant that followed Admiral Allen uh, actually ended up. Allen? Undoing uh, some of the some of the changes, so we kind of ended up sort of halfway between. Um, some things were were carried out, some weren't. So I was wondering um, what what yourself and uh, General Berger are kind of doing to to set up the continuity so that the changes that you've begun uh, will be seen through to the end. Sure. So d difficult question, um, and I, I spoke with Chairman Dunford this morning about what what is referred to as the the reverse Pony Express. Everybody knows the Pony Express works like a champ, right? Because you got you know the same rider but fresh horse. Well, we do the reverse in the military often. It's, it's the exact same horse, same unit, but new commander, you know, just, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this better and harder. It's the same young Lance corporals, you know, uh, young private Joes who are like, here we go again. First, you have to convince people that within your organization, that it is the plan. It's not my plan. It's not your plan. It's the plan. And it's based off the national defense strategy, which comes from the democratic process. Again, national security strategy, national military strategy, national defense strategy. Works like a champ, right in the Constitution, um, which is the only thing I ever swore to uphold. Um, so you, you have to tie it back to something much greater than yourself. And then you got to demonstrate its efficacy. You should be arguing, which is why we war game and experiment and test and, and cajole each other and pick at each other. Um, what you don't do is handpick somebody who, who's, who's with you. Ah, we need that person to be in a... That's bad because that also flies in the face of the Constitution, which is that the president will appoint and the Senate will confirm. I'm, again, poli sci major. I uh, like to think I still have a little bit of study left in me for, for how this experiment uh, that we have is working um, the, the Democratic Experiment of America. Um, you have to demonstrate it so others go, oh, you know, I may not have been a fan, but you, know, you got that right. You got that right. And one of the things I would do, <clears throat> excuse me, is dramatic change in the Marine Corps. Actually, not so much. 182,000, 175,000. 7,000, really? That's dramatic. I've been in the Marine Corps from about 180, 179, up to almost 209,000. So I've seen that. Um, we've had battalions like uh, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines. Uh, I'm Catholic, so I can say this, has stood up and stood down more times than a Catholic mass. You know, up there on there. Uh, We've, we've brought in new platforms, old platforms are gone. We've done this already. Um, infantry battalions, 896, now they're going to be 810. Now that's, that's not small, but th that doesn't define us. What defines us is being light, lethal, expeditionary, highly mobile, organically mobile, uh, with Marines of moral character who can make moral, ethical, and incredibly consequential decisions on a battlefield at age 19, age 19. And that's, uh, that's the stunning part. Do we have our training pipeline, right? So I would say there actually isn't that significant a change. It's, it's definitely changed, but if, it, if, if you're, if you're riding on tanks, that that was a big change because we eliminated tanks and we got rid of horses too. We don't, uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, and I'm not a fan 
you, you got to make a bold change. Go to the back right. And yes, ma'am. We'll go to the center next. <clears throat> Hi. Nice to meet you. Yes. Great question. So, so first, let's go to this. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear, uh, frankly, being, again, being candid, we will sometimes be condemned from both sides. We're either woke and wimpy or we're extremist, misogynistic and everything else. Uh, I'm neither. I don't participate in the political process. I'm here to ensure that it can be participated in. Um, so we are apolitical, must be. So if you look at, um, I'm, I'm a math guy, right? If you look at your adversaries, there's, and they are some of them quite large, potential adversaries. There's 330 million Americans. So in, in my assessment, as I look at it very analytically, mathematically, and unemotionally, I cannot afford to exclude 50% of the population because of their sex. I, I, I can't do that. So you have to build an organization where people, one, our, our job is to defend the Constitution. All stop. Sometimes that can be um, bloody, right? If we are if we are attacked, right? You can't have an organization, in my opinion, where recruiting challenges will persist. The propensity to enlist goes down. Where you have you have segments of society who don't see a place for themselves in your organization, whether that is fifty uh, percent women. 15% African American, 20% uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, eight, 9% Asian. You, 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 everybody has to see a place themselves. So if you ask, it's funny, if you ask our female leaders, um, Major General Shea, um, Brigadier General Maylock, um, you know, uh, Val ja Brigadier General Val uh, Jackson, I don't, this is them, I don't want anything different, right? Because I don't want to be seen, oh, well, you know, you, you got here because you are. You have to, as an organization, establish a, a, an outreach, a recruiting effort to say, we are open. We, we want you in our ranks. And then you got to demonstrate it. We're about 10% uh, uh, female in the Marine Corps right now. Um, and then how do you hold and retain? You know, as we start off in the officer corps, about 14% women. By the time you're colonel, it's about six. Just things start happening. Life starts happening. Or did you not have a pathway for women who step up to become the next Brigadier General Shea or the next Laura Richardson in the Army. She's Southcom. Um, we think we have a pretty good pathway there, but we don't want to drink our own bathwater. So a lot of it is our recruiting effort. Where do you recruit? Who do you recruit? What are your commercials look like? Do people see themselves? Again, it's not about being woke or anything else. It's about do people see an opportunity for themselves in your organization? Because here's what I know. If the Marine Corps doesn't recruit you, if we don't recruit um, uh, Ms. Park, and she happens to be the best, uh, or Emily, uh, Emily, no, Emily, I got it right. Uh, even though, even though university of Texas graduate, um, you, you knew that was coming. If, if they don't come to the Marine Corps, then I've lost the best intelligence officer, logistics officer, air traffic controller to another service or to, to civil society, which, which is great as an American, but, but I need it here. So you, that's what you do is you do an outreach and you demonstrate that there's a place for you here and you make sure that you don't have things which will cause people to not come to you, sexual assault, um, you know, misogynistic behavior in general. And again, we are a product of society. Do we have that? We do. We, we work every day to stamp it out and we have been unsuccessful in several places and I won't lie to you about that, but that is kind of a daily grind for how do you recruit the right person? It's not about what we did to you. It's about who we brought in. You gotta be very careful about who you bring in, as you know. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I think we got time for probably one last question here in the center. All right, I'm from Texas. I try to be succinct, but that is not one of my strong suits. Yeah. Yes, ma'am.
Yes. Yeah, so the, 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 first, uh, the, the first point, yes, we are focused on retention. Um, it is incredibly expensive and difficult to recruit medical uh, propensity to enlist, et cetera. So when you get someone and you train them, why would you not want to retain them? Now, we, we cannot be a force of all people of my age. That's not going to work in, in, in our profession uh, because, you know, right now I go into the gym with the youngsters and, uh, you know, they're moving 110-pound dumbbells around Right. For me, that is a significant emotional event. Right. So, so they, we, we need that pulling chains and chalks off of aircraft. You know, I, I, that's probably not in my future right now because uh, everything hurts. Uh, it doesn't really hurt, but you know, I'm 57, so it hurts a little bit. So you, you have to calculate first, how much can you mature the force? How much can you afford? Because we pay people who've been around longer, we pay them more. So you have to first do the calculation. And we did that. We use some, uh, some algorithm tools down at our headquarters, Marine Corps, in Quantico to say, how much could we mature the force and where do we need it? Who do you want to, uh, for the pilots in the room, private or otherwise, who do you want as your airframer working on your airframe, a staff sergeant with 12 years or a young Lance Corporal with two? I know who I want working on my airplane. I, now I, those, you need to build those next artisans, right? Underneath the tutelage of a master craftsman. But, um, we did a calculation on how much we could mature the force and build off that experience. So the other question is, to find out how uh, effective it is, is how often you measure. We measure far too quickly, far too often. You, it will take a cohort, which is four years, before we know, did we get that right? Four years. That requires some incredible institutional patience. You can keep taking the temperature all day long, but it's like cooking in the oven. You can, you can keep popping the oven door open, but all you're doing is letting heat out, right? You mix up eggs, flour, sugar, milk, put it, it's 22 minutes. Right. You put it in the oven, it's 22 minutes, I'm telling you, at 350. That's how long it takes. Now, um, until you develop leap head technology like a microwave, and even then, eh, it may not taste the same, but, but getting better. So we have to make sure we don't assess too often because it, it'd be a little bit like going on a fitness regime. Okay, I'm going to you know, bulk up biceps and be fit. And I do the gym workout on Monday and I look in the mirror Tuesday and go, well, well that didn't work. You, you, you got to stay with it for six weeks before you take a, a pulse. Um, I think one of our biggest things is we are institutionally impatient because the threat is always moving, which again, takes me back to the beginning. You have to know where you're going. A very wise man who may be sitting in this room uh, has said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You got to find out where you're going and have it be based on the why and have the facts to back it up and the data. And then you got to stay the course, being willing to change and, and modulate yourself when new data presents itself or when the threat adjusts. But that's, that's the best answer I can, I can give you. We'll know in about four years. And I, I think we got that mostly right, but not 100% right, guaranteed. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming out. And uh, if you'd please join me. And... Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> me, uh, I just want to wrap up. <laughs> Sorry. So this is where the military is great because, you know, he's a lieutenant colonel, so I can say, hey, can I get two minutes? And he's kind of obligated to say, sure. <laughs> um, so it works well. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to go speak at it because the Marine Corps birthday is coming up 247 years. So I'm going to go speak at a, at a luncheon here, um, which is great, but I, I am genuinely appreciative. One courtesy is like a lost art these days. I'm just going to say that courtesy is, a, has become a lost art. So I am, I'm incredibly grateful, uh, for the courtesy, uh, that you let me come here. Let me, um, offer my opinions, uh, which, which you may or may not uh, agree with. I'm just, I appreciate the courtesy, right? It's just like, it's a lost art. So I'm, I'm truly grateful for that because you don't get that everywhere. So people, oh, you know, this school or that school has, I've been here before with Dr. Carter when uh, he was being interviewed by Graham Allison, as I told you. And it's always been a courteous uh, place where people share ideas and, uh, and challenge, which I mean, courteous and, hey, we're going we're gonna to throw, that. those are not mutually exclusive, right? I mean, that's, it's a little bit like hockey. I mean, it's contact sport. So I just, I just appreciate it. And I appreciate you allowing me to come here and you taking a couple minutes to come and listen. And I hope um, that you learned something. I, I learned from your questions because I'm questioning my own assessments. Any good planner questions their own assessments full time. And again, I would, would leave it just with, if you have the opportunity to come to Quantico or to come to uh, South Carolina, where Marine Corps Depot Paris Island is, Recruit Depot or, or uh, Camp Pendleton, 
you got Marines in this class. You say, hey, I want to go see that. He said it. How do I go on a Friday? We'll, we'll get you there. It's your Marine Corps that we are talking about changing, which is part of your national defense. Um, you know, uh, so it's, it's open to you. And, uh, and I hope to see you out there because we, we are proud of what we do. And we'd be, we'd be proud to show you what we do uh, as, uh, as taxpayers. Because uh, even if you're not a U.S. citizen, oh, you're paying taxes. Uh, every time you, you go in and you buy something, that's how Texas uh, does it, 8.7% sales tax. Um, so trust me, I know. I hear it from my mom every time I talk to her. Um, it's like, yes, mom, it's still 8.75. I got it. Um, you're always welcome because it is your Marine Corps. So thank you. That was it. Thank you. Thanks, Jack.